record. So welcome to Archives Live. This is our first guest of the year, our second stream. We did a little stream last week for NAM, and I'm really excited to have David Van Pelt here um, from all the way on the other side of the world. So depending on what side you're on, you're looking at opposite sides. I'm streaming from New York, and he is streaming from um, Australia. So it's very, very exciting for us to be able to coordinate this. So good morning, Australia, and good evening, um, everyone else. All right. So uh, I'm going to bring him in. Let's bring him back. There you go. And I, um, I first want to say that David's been an amazing supporter of the Alan R. Perlman Foundation, and we're really grateful. You were a contributor last year for the 2600 Symposium, and you first really caught my interest after we had a conversation. I think it might have actually been on Instagram. Yeah, yeah. I think it was actually. Yeah, uh, and you told me a wonderful story, which we're going to get to a little bit later. This is sort of about how you got into ARPS. Um, but we want to go back to the beginning, and um, let's start with the, the very beginning. So um, you are a keyboardist and a synthesis. Have you always been a keyboardist in your music um, career? Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, I, I did um, – at first I had no idea what a synthesizer was. So I did uh, the, the traditional sort of piano first and – I liked it, but it never really grabbed me. And then I saw a digital digital keyboard and people were talking about these things called synthesizers and I had no idea what it meant. I just thought it was like another digital keyboard and perhaps with a fancy name called synthesizer. Um, and then as soon, as soon as I got into that world, it was like a rabbit hole, like a, the most enjoyable <laughs> rabbit hole ever, but it, just, it engulfed me and I haven't been able to get enough since like I, I just think about it all the time I hear the sound in my head all the time I love them absolutely love them so yeah it's been a fun ride did you start off with the traditional piano lessons as a kid yeah it was it was a funny story actually I I could not play a note of piano I couldn't tell you the difference between the white keys or the black keys I had no idea then got in trouble at primary school um or I think, I, I, I can't remember, it was grade three. I did something wrong and the teacher kept me in at lunchtime and I was at one of those primary schools where instead of ringing the bell, they put music to the final countdown, which is my absolute favourite song in the world and I just heard the whole synth introduction. So, all right, let's go ahead and I'm going to uh, go ahead and play um, Entropy. And then we're going to start again after, after we play this. So we're going to play a little bit of Entropy.
right. So um, we're stopping, not because I don't want to play more, but I actually really want people to go to your website and go to your YouTube and check out your band and band camp. And we'll have more of your music soon. But I was really yeah, blown you. away when I saw that. Um, wow. And, 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 and of course, um, I, my heartstrings pumped a little bit when I saw the the uh, Odyssey up there in, 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 in all its glory. Um, so let's go back to the synthesizer discussion because I know that um, Odyssey is relatively new in your collection, maybe the past um, four years or so, is that correct? Yeah, um, it was 2000 and I think it was, I've actually got the little uh, pass from when I went, so 2016. Um, it was the first time that I saw, heard, and played the Odyssey, and it just it blew my mind. Absolutely blew my mind. You Loved. told me a wonderful story about how you got into the Odyssey. Um, I would love it if you would share it with everybody. It was it, it was it was the thing that yeah, really, absolutely. Really, was wonderful. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, um, it's it's kind of a sad but happy story. So. I was playing in a melodic metal band here in Melbourne and we got the tremendous opportunity to support uh, some of my heroes actually and early influences, which is a Finnish band called Stradivarius. And it was the most amazing tour, three months, I think it was like 32 different countries and I'd never done anything like that, waking up on a bus in a new country every day, meeting new people every day, and then hanging out with my musical heroes like Jens Johansson's, you know, absolute keyboard god. And I was sitting there having a drinking competition which, with him, which <laughs> I had an interview on Progfest and said, you, you just, you don't do that with Jens Johansson. And anyone that knows me knows I can't drink properly anyway. So it wasn't a smart <laughs> move. But I got to hang out with like my musical heroes. I got to um, go to the singer's house and, you know, we're all just chilling, having a few drinks, having jams. So it was basically like a, a dream come true and then some. And then I flew home and as a profession, I'm a secondary school teacher and I love my job and I work with the most amazing people. But every time I left Europe and flew back to Australia, I sort of, I got that melancholy of like, oh, you know, I don't want to leave what I just did because you get, you know, it's not like slowly moving back into reality. It's like this, here you are up here and then bang, here's reality back, back to the grind and everything. And it was hard to take and I actually got quite depressed. Um, I didn't realize it at the time, but just trying to fit back into how everything worked and, and coming off that high was, was really difficult. And, my wife, who is just the most amazing person, um, without me knowing, was like, oh, God, how do I cheer him up? And she it got me a pass, and I've got it here, to this thing called Synth Sunday, which I'd never heard of. And we, she didn't tell me where we're going. She's like, all right, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to take you. You're just going to go and don't think, just enjoy it. And I said, okay, no worries. And I, I, we got off the train and we turned up at this huge factory and there's all these synths everywhere. And there was people like me, um, which is rare because I always thought that, it, you know, I was a bit of a loner in that regard to the, to the analog synth stuff because yeah, I, I, I didn't really have an outlet to, to play as much as I would have liked to in that regard. And I remember Rich Formadoni uh, had flown in from New York and he was showcasing the Odyssey. And I was always a Moog guy. Like I, I got the Mini Moog and, you know, Sub32 and Grandmother and, and they're obviously a fantastic, fantastic company and, and love them. But I never got into the art stuff because I, I missed – I wasn't born in the 70s and I grew up in the 80s and a lot of the art stuff had stopped by then. And he introduced the Odyssey and you could just play it. And the moment I played it, it just blew my mind. It, it had a sound to it that I'd never heard before, which, and this is going to sound weird, 
Um, but it's like if you put two sawtooth waves together with a little bit of ring mod, it's like it's burning. Like it's got this burning sound to it. And the faders and everything, I felt as if I'd played it before, which I never had. And it was, I was a bit selfish at the time because they had four where you could play and, you know, everyone wanted to have a go. And I was there for about an hour and a half. <laughs> I was just on this thing going crazy with it. And um, Rich did the, the introduction and, and he won't remember this conversation, I'm sure, but he had just flown in from New York. So he was absolutely... Uh, yeah, um, I mean, I fell in love with that story, and I hope most of the people got to hear this. Um, and um, tell us about, um, so you you started playing ARPS, and, you know, you were playing in Odyssey for a while. It was in your recording of Entropy, is that correct? Correct, yeah, correct. I actually, um, I experimented with a lot of different synthesizers in the studio and doubled some Odyssey with some Moog stuff, um, which actually creates a really unique timbre. It was, it was actually quite beautiful. Very hard to do because the Odyssey with the prop proportional pitch control to try and double a, like a, you're trying to glide or you're trying to modulate from like a C to a D is, is really hard to do on the proportional pitch control. But after many, 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 many attempts, I finally got it right. It was fantastic. Um, those two actually complement each other beautifully. And the ring modulator on the Odyssey is just phenomenal. Um, just creates that real rich distorted sound. So Doubling the two was, was great. And, and in the film clip, I wanted to to actually play the mini mode and the Odyssey together because in the recording, that's what I used to double the sound. So yeah, fantastic. Absolutely fantastic combination. Really, really, really great. Killer sound. I just, I love the sound. As I was saying before, before it, it cut out, like ARPs have just got an amazing lyrical quality. And I mostly, well, not mostly, pretty much always use them for leads. So I'm a very big leads player. Um, I love creating melodic leads because I've come from a very melodic background. So all the things that I do have to have a strong melody in it for my music anyway. And I just find they just blend and cut through beautifully with this tremendously lyrical sound. Um, so that's why I, I just absolutely, absolutely adore them. And yeah. I, I really thank I thank my wife for taking me to Synth Sunday and, and Rich Formadoni for doing the fantastic presentation because, yeah, from since then it's sold me. Well, I think they do play well together. And this is one of the, one of the beauties of how machines test, stand the test of time and the fact that, you know, the modern musician has so many choices. I mean, there was choices back in the 70s, but not as many, and it was it was a very different flavor. And I mm. I really encourage the idea of using ARPs and Moogs together. And Lisa Belladonna mm. does, people at MAP do, many musicians do. And it, you know, in my mind's eye, it's no different than, you know, someone, you know, has has a Stratocaster or or, you know, has a has has a you know the, the different kind of guitars you know why not yeah you know just exactly. you may favor one for one sound may favor something for another um uh, the combination yeah. of the two especially a keyboardist gets to be a multi-instrumentalist in the same same tune same composition which is uh you know Absolutely. outside of the recording world you know one one guitarist doesn't have that option and i think that's something that's really marvelous with with keyboard playing is that you can, you can play two instruments at the same time you know when i, I went to see mm -hmm. Matt, pat Matheny recently and and the keyboardist was just you know out of this world just amazing yeah yeah and and one hand here there's so many flavors you know that, that's the thing i love now i think 
really at the moment, like we were saying before we started the interview, like we, it might not be a great time for gigging, live music with the pandemic everywhere, but the choice that musicians have in terms of instruments has never been better. Um, for so many years, there's been, you know, Wurlitzers and, and Fender Rhodes, and, and you sort of had those two as your main sort of electro pian electromechanical pianos. And now there's this new fantastic one that's just been released called a Valente, which is made by this amazing creator called Tiago Valente. and roads, which... Maybe, oops, maybe we're being hacked. Maybe there's a... a hacker. Yeah, or, or, or we're, we're, we're under a cyber attack. That's what it kind of feels <laughs> like. <laughs> this time I was, I was talking and you were gone. I think we've, we've kind of switched places. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, um, it's, a, it's a big call, you know, to come from New York down to, you know, the bottom of Australia, it's, it's, we're pushing the limits of technology <laughs> here. And that, that's, I, that's great. I think we should push it and see what, you know, I mean, that's what technology yeah. is all about going one more, one stratosphere. One more round. Maybe in that, in that realm, I want to show a little bit of um, what we're going to end the show with. Um, the 2600 solo video. Um, and uh, I want to go to this because you made a, a leap from a, an Odyssey to a 2600. And then if I'm not mistaken, you said, okay, well, I can't have both. And then you missed the, you, you bought the 2600 and then you missed the Odyssey so much you went and got it back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. The amount of times I've bought the Odyssey again is, it, it's, yeah, it's laughable. So I had to sell the Odyssey to fund the 2600. Love the 2600 a bit, but really did miss the Odyssey. And Korg stopped making um, the full-size version. And I was on to Korg here in Australia going, I need to know are you making more? Is this like a ploy where you say, oh, there's no more, and then you're going to release more, and they're like, no, 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 you know, we're not. And I'm like, oh, man. And then I found this guy who actually was using it um, in a recording studio with Tim Minchin, who's a fantastic um, musician here in Australia and um, plays all over the place in New Zealand and everywhere. And uh, he's, he was selling it. So I finally got uh, another one another one back and it was funny when I got it back it was just like an old friend had come back and I'm like oh yes I shouldn't have sold you in the first place and my wife is always right she's like don't sell that don't sell that one don't sell that one and I do and then she's right I want it back and then I do all the research again I'm sure many city people out there have done the same thing you do all the research again you find it you end up buying it back for more than you sold it I probably shouldn't say that now but <laughs> I think I told her it was the same price. <laughs> oh, now it's now it's been recorded. If we're on the yeah, line, I, I think we are actually. <laughs> in trouble, in trouble now. Yeah. Um, all right, so let's watch a bit of that. This is a twenty six hundred solo video. Roger roll, Atlantis. Houston now controlling the flight of Atlantis. The space shuttle spreads its wings one final time for the start of a sentimental journey into history. All right, uh, lift off and the clock has started. Yes, sir, reading you loud and clear.
Well, I always love the. Always has to have, I don't know, space and synths just go so well together. And I was able for the start of that video, there's this amazing website where you can jump on and they've got real audio from the different space missions and it's free. So you can download all of the different astronauts talking to Houston and everything and, and throw them into Pro Tools or whatever and that affects and it's just, yeah, synths and space. Well, your dad knew that because he made all of the uh, op amps, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he was really into science fiction. Uh, he would, he took me to a lot of science fiction movies, and as a matter of fact, this is going to date me, but I uh, I saw 2001 A Space Odyssey in the movie theater, yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's crazy, it's crazy, yeah. I Yep, I lost all my little balloons, so it's just, you know, I just have to switch off between you and me, but I think I'm going to keep it simple right now, so, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, let's get back to Acolyte for a moment. Um, you know, we, we, we got cut off when you were talking about, you know, your your background ab about playing music, and originally, the, you know, you, you, you weren't... Uh, you didn't you didn't you didn't start off as as a sight reading virtuoso is what I understand and then but you developed into no, I, this um, amazing keyboardist. So what what happened in between and how did you end up getting to acolyte? Um, it, it's I, I I'll tell you the story and and you probably won't believe it because I I don't believe it myself. So going back to what I was saying before, I heard the final countdown when I was in year oh no I was grade three and got the goosebumps and everything and couldn't play a note on piano and then that night I went home from primary school and sat at the piano and just recreated the theme and I was like oh okay um this is how it works okay and then from then and I'm not joking like on in all honesty from then I can almost hear hear and play what I hear. Um, like, I'm sure there'll be someone, you know, they'll come up with some Rachmaninoff piece and go, okay, play this. Uh, <laughs> not as good as that. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of the 70s, 80s um, and music from, like, you hear it and I'll be, I haven't got perfect pitch, but it's close and I can work out what the chords are pretty quickly. And it's a blessing and a curse, like, because my brain does that. I could be in Thailand getting a massage or something and they'll play that lovely, relaxing Thai, you know, music and I'll meant to be switching off. My brain will be going, that's a D minor, that's a B flat, <laughs> that's a C. <laughs> you know? And, yeah, it's, it's just, it's crazy. It, it never switches off from that. And that just meant that instead of doing the traditional piano lessons, which I did, um, all of my piano teachers just went, well, there's no point teaching you how to read because you're just copying what I'm playing by ear. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so they were great. They just would set up, like, give me a genre and go, all right, write a, a song in this genre or write a song in that genre. And that really helped. So I never got traditional lessons as such, but um, just being able to, to pick up on things really helps me to, to learn how music works. And then my love for all of um, 70s music and 80, early 80s stuff came in and loved Deep Purple and then got into more heavy stuff like uh, Inve Malmsteen from Sweden and Stradivarius from Finland and Nightwish from Finland. And that just led me to melodic metal stuff. And then after the Stradivarius tour and um, two other tours of uh, Europe and other bands, I just wanted to combine my love for vintage keys in a band. And Acolytes had supported uh, my previous bands. And I, I remember listening and watching to them, watching them on stage going, you know, some vintage sounds in there could really work and could make, make it this whole new thing because obviously keyboards have got such a, a rich palette of sound that you can use and, and I'm a big 
lover of like Mellotrons and Hammonds and, and all of Fender Rhodes and Wurlitzes and all that sort of stuff. And yeah, got in contact with them and they, it was this sort of push pull thing where they were interested, I was interested, but we didn't want to say anything um, <laughs> together. <laughs> You know, as to who's it's like the beginning of a, a, it's like a, a courting <laughs> relationship. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And the singer Morgan, you know, we met a number of times and we we're sort of just testing each other out. And and then it happened and I joined and we had a jam and it just fit. The sounds just worked. And our second album, um, I used everything that I had in my studio. So we had on their Fender Rhodes. My Hammond C3 is still at the studio because it's too heavy to move. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Kai at Sing Sing Studios in Melbourne, you've still got my Hammond. <laughs> I'm a good guy. Look after me next time. Um, no, he, they're great at Sing Sing. They're, he's like, oh, look, I'll, I'll oil your Hammond if you want to leave it here. And I'm like, well, that works for me if it works for you. Um, but, yeah, the ARP stuff and uh, the Moog stuff, and it's great. It's it just opened up that that pathway that I wanted to to bring in more vintage stuff into into that world, into that sort of prog world. And I've never done progressive music before. I was strictly like melodic metal stuff and big solos and all of that. And yeah, it was it was a challenge because we work. Our drummer is is like one of those musical geniuses who. He plays an ambidextrous kit and oh, he did wow. his master's in ambidexterity. So he has, a, you could split the kit down the middle and you've got the left version and the right version. And sometimes he'll decide, yeah, I'm going to play left handed this gig and then next you can reply, right. I, I don't know why you'd want to do that, but it, it works for him. So he loves to like be like, yeah, let's, let's do this section in 11 or let's do this section 13 and I'm like, oh. <laughs> um, but it's been a great, yeah, great challenge. And it's fantastic to use the ARPs and the modes, um, in that, in that genre, it lends itself really well. And it was, it was funny when I was getting them all serviced, I, I played some of the leads on more rompler things. Cause that's all I had at the time. And you can just hear the difference. Like everyone in the band was like, yeah, whereas you get, the Moogs and the Arps back and it's like, yeah, <laughs> there's, there's some power there. So yeah, love it. Absolutely love it. So I know that um, much of our audience um, loves gear. I wanted to show a, just a snippet of the the studio that you recorded Entropy in. Especially yeah, absolutely. You're talking about that, the, the big ham and organ. So. Yeah. Yeah. Let's find, where is that? Oh, there we go. G'day guys, this is Dave coming to you live from Sing Sing Recording Studios after about 15 hours of keyboard tracking. So I'm absolutely wrecked but all my gear is ready to go and I'm going to give you a very quick run through of what we just used for this big session that we've had this morning. Uh, Centre point of my rig is my absolutely beloved 1957 Hammond C3 organ. This thing is an absolute beast. It weighs about 120 kilograms and it took four of us to lift it up the stairs. But when people say, why do you carry all this heavy stuff when you can just get it through like a normal rompler or something? These things just sound amazing. Um, it is absolutely rock solid and the sounds you get from it with all the tube preamps and everything is just pure rock and roll. So is, there's a big reason why it's at the center of my rig. Um, I run it through an old school, well I shouldn't say old school because it is relatively new, but an old school effect which is a Mogafoga ring modulator. Uh, it is a fantastic little device to build up a little bit more of the crunch, but also some fantastic sci-fi effects where you're able to mix in the ring modulated signal, signal sorry, with the Hammond signal. And it is, yeah, one of those little added spices to the flavour. On top I've got my trusty called Kronos which I have mostly used for piano sounds and also some pads and choirs which I can't get from analog gear so it's been around the world three times with me and it's still here so 
bless its cotton socks. And with that, I mostly use the inboard effects, but um, yeah, it hasn't let me down, which is great. Uh, some of my other effects I've been using today, we've got the Boss RE20 Space Echo, which is a digital recreation of the original tape Echo from the 70s, which is beautiful, and I use it mostly for the Echo, but also this amazingly trashy spring reverb, which just adds a haunting haunting effect. Um, got the old classic small clone, oh sorry, small stone from Electro Harmonics, just a phase shifter, which is nice for pads, just to get, bring a bit of movement. And over here, I've had most of the synths running through Mogafoga MF-104M analog delay, which is, look, it's a, it's a beast, so many things you can do with it, but really the, the killer thing about it, it's so warm, it's literally like tape, absolutely gorgeous, which is fantastic. <laughs> Let's see if I can get to bed. There you are. <laughs> I love how you describe the uh, the different instruments. It's 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 a uh, it's it, it's a uh, really really interesting how you you know the warm sounds and the trashy sounds and and, yeah. and, and all like that. Um, so just a little plug for everybody, and then we'll get to some questions, and you can uh, uh, show us uh, what you have in your home studio. Um, so you can get. Uh, Entropy, um, the band uh, that the album by Acolyte on Bandcamp, and anywhere else. Yeah, it's um, people can go to our website, um, and basically, if you type in um, Acolyte uh, Australian bands, things will pop up, and we've got a fantastic merch section where obviously there's T-shirts and and the albums. It's also, um, if you want to get a taste, it's also on Spotify. Um, our new album, Entropy, which is the one um, Dana Lovely showed the film clip. Uh, so if you if you really do like that old school sort of 70s vibe, um, I think you'll really, really enjoy it. And the musicians I play with are just amazing. Morgan, the singer, has just got this phenomenal voice. And Jason, the bass player, is just rock solid. And I already mentioned Chris, the drummer, who's... Yeah, he and I do a lot of work together. He's actually helping, been helping me with my solo album. Um, yeah, he, he just, his drumming is phenomenal. So I'm very lucky to be surrounded by some amazing musicians. And it's a very, um, it's a very dynamic and powerful album in the themes that it presents. It's best to, I don't want to say it's a concept album, but it's, it's close. It's, it's best to listen to it from... Stop. I was going to ask you about that. Um, you know, one of the one of my favorites is the idiosyncrasy. Yeah. 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 yeah I like that. Um, I like yeah. that a lot. I'm just going to play just a, a just a, the opening because the opening is just so beautiful.
I put the link to Bandcamp, so uh, definitely check out uh, this this um, amazing album. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, the other plug I want to do is um, for those of you who stuck it out, I really appreciated. Uh, while we've had technical difficulties in the past, this has definitely uh, surpassed what I've experienced so far. So <laughs> I, I appreciate it. Uh, you, know, you got to see me go through, uh, you know, uh, denial, grief, um, anger, <laughs> all the emotions that go with, <laughs> with, a, with a stream gone bad. Um, but anyway, um, uh, we have just... Uh, as a as a foundation, we've just uh, gotten to a d new point in our online presence and our YouTube uh, abilities. And you'll notice on the lower the bottom of the chat, there is a icon. It has a little money icon, and then there's a little chat icon. So those are ways to monetize. Um, so if anyone has uh, the impetus or the desire, you can click one of those little stickers or uh, chat, super chat people stickers. And, and uh, I think they give you different uh, amounts of money. I know that I got this idea from the ProSynth network. Um, uh, Robbie um, Puricelli kind of helped me with uh, trying to get us to the next level. So um, if uh, check it out, maybe, uh, you know, give us a little donation um, and maybe I can get a new uh, modem for <laughs> <laughs> for the foundation <laughs> no this is definitely an anomaly you know anyway um so um all right enough of uh, the the commercial promos let's get back to uh talking a little bit about your gear and see if anybody from the audience has any questions so um this yeah, is sure. the time where uh you have uh your 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 odyssey in the back you have your 2600 behind you mm -hmm. And oh, thank you, David. Um, and if you would like to ask um, David, D David, uh, another David just uh, made a donation. So I'm, I'm thanking oh. him. Yeah, yeah. So um, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. We actually rely on donations to keep ourselves going. Um, but I would like to um, ha open it up to questions um, for our guest and like that. So. Um, Let's see. Uh, so Lil agrees about ha this being a favorite song from the album as well. So Lil seventy three. And uh -huh. yeah, what a legend. Yeah, yeah. There's 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 sort of a, a uh, Asian Eastern feel to some of the introductory music, and that's mm. what, yeah, yeah. So we tell actually me, um, tell me a little bit about that. We we used um, Chris, the drummer, knows a lot of people in the classical scene. So he was able to get some fantastic musicians to play real instruments. And that's what we wanted for this album was where possible to use real instruments and not rely too much on um, digital recreations where possible. Um, not that there's anything wrong with them. Like I don't want to start the whole digital analog debate, but we, we really wanted that sort of warm old school sound. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, it was, it was great to have, you know, we had, uh, flute players, we had clarinet players, we had mm. some violins mm. and just the combination of that sound with analog synths and Mellotrons, so haunting. You know, it's, it's just magic. I really do think that in the 70s with the instruments that they had, the combination, they really got right. Like, you know, the Hammond organ, Mellotron, Rhodes, Wurlitzers, all of that stuff, they really, really got right. And, yeah, I, just rediscovering them now, it's heaven. <laughs> Absolute heaven. So we have our first question to you. Are there any vintage sure. notes, analog or digital that you would like to own? Oh, fantastic question. Um, yeah, the, the, <laughs> the, the, probably the number would be endless. Uh, if I had an endless bank balance, I would really love to own some more polyphonic synths. I, I love mono synths. And I have been lucky enough to save up and purchase a Profit Rev 2 16 voice, which services a lot of the um, polyphonic needs. But 
I remember going uh, with a friend of mine from Switzerland, um, took me to this amazing, I think it was in Austria, amazing keyboard museum. I, I was in there for a day and I could have easily stayed there. They had a bed there and I actually asked if I could sleep there. <laughs> I just wanted to stay. Um, and I played a Oberheim Matrix 12, which is worth about a house now, but the the string and pad sounds out of that were absolutely phenomenal. And even um, their Matrix series is, is absolutely stunning. So I definitely would uh, love that. Um, you know, if anyone wants to donate one, like feel free. <laughs> um, that would definitely be for, for Polyphonic. That'd be great. I'd love to get my hands on um, a ARP Pro Soloist just to to play one because I've, I've never, never actually played one. Um, or even an, an axe would be great. Um, a quadra would be amazing. Uh, the, the, the list goes on. One of the things I'm actually looking at at the moment, which I'm, I'm trying to save up and afford, is a, a new, brand new instrument. Uh, brand new. It's an electromechanical piano called a Valente. And it is, as I was saying before, when, before it cut out, it's like a blend between a Rhodes and a Wurlitzer. Still got hammers. It's still completely analog. Absolutely fantastic. And, and I just, I have got nothing but respect for the creators because that, you know, in a time where romplers are, are all over the place and, you know, this whole vintage vibe has come back in terms of um, playing digital keyboards with road sounds and Wurlitzers. They've created a, a brand new instrument, which, you know, good on them. And I just think it's fantastic when you think about all of the options we have now and the different instruments we have now, unbelievable. So yeah, having all of those things would be amazing. I'm, I'm building a, well, not yet, starting to build a studio at the moment at my house, as, as Dina knows, a, a tree hit my property in June last year mm. and took out a fair bit. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I, I always wanted to turn the garage at the time into a, a, a proper recording studio and um, the tree went through the garage and took out not just the garage but the deck and part of the side walls. So now we're rebuilding that so hopefully you know if i get all these things i'd be able to move back in there and start recording so that would be great but i mean this little space i mean now is fantastic it's very inspirational and i try to put a lot of planets and i love that but having two or three people in here it's not great <laughs> yeah yeah i understand oh that's great um so tell us about you your solo project it sounds like you uh, have some plans going yeah so i in 2000 when the pandemic hit i was doing um because i'm a secondary school teacher i was doing remote learning and it just meant that i was on the computer all the time and i was in this studio here because that was before the tree hit the house and um all my keys are, are plugged into the same computer system that I was doing remote learning from. So in between classes, I just thought, well, I've got this time, I may as well start recording and, and making an album. And that's exactly what happened. Um, you know, it, it, it's basically similar to a lot of the material I sent to you, Dina, for the 50th anniversary of the 2600 and then the little synth piece for this. Some are a bit longer. Um, very obviously synth driven, um, but with real drums, Chris is doing the drums for me, which is fantastic. And he's done a lot of the producing, which is great, but yeah, a mixture of, um, sequential circuit stuff, Moog stuff, uh, ARP stuff, of course. And yeah, it's, it's kind of like, um, theme, I guess you say like almost electronic film scores, but each song is is a theme because again, I, I, I struggle doing things without melody. You know, I always have to have melody in there. Um, yeah, so it's it was almost completed and I, I, I got a producer here in Melbourne called Mike, who's an absolute 
top guy and he's still interested in the project but i had to put it on hold when the the tree <laughs> took everything out um but as soon as everything gets back uh i i really look forward to releasing it because yeah it's very different very melodic very very synth driven so anyone who's in that sort of world i think would really really enjoy it it's been a fun project Sounds great. Wow. Um, so is, um, you said it's very melodic and it's very different. Are, are there going to be vocals? No, it's, it was interesting because I, I've been so incredibly fortunate of being able to, to tour with people, different bands overseas and, and met some amazing vocalists. And I, I toyed with the idea of having vocals, um, but I decided against it and instead have gone um, with sending the files out and getting different gu guitarists that I've met uh, all over the world to to play on it because nothing against vocals, but I kind of want the music to be the vocals themselves, if that makes sense. Um, and you can listen to it and create your own theme, whereas if I sort of put vocals over it, one, I'd have to think of, lyrics <laughs> and then secondly i don't know to me I, I love listening to instrumental stuff because i can apply my own meaning to what it could be mm -hmm. so i wanted to keep it keep it like that at this point so the voice is going to be in another keyboard or another yeah yeah exactly exactly you know the melody lines the, the thing i always struggled with was the melody lines that i would create tend to you know get catchy in my head and then it's it's hard to fit the vocals around those things and I spent well um, it doesn't have to be vocals I can make my own rules here so you know, let's 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 just leave it and yeah I mean I've enjoyed definitely enjoyed that process it's it's been a great great learning experience with how the different analog synths behave when you record and you know the different warming up times you can, you can be totally fine and then you start recording and then it's dropped, you know, half a semitone or, <laughs> but that's the beauty. That's the beauty of vintage gear. And I wouldn't change it for a thing. Why do you think, um, there is that desire for vintage gear when you could have, one could have so many options, so many digital options, especially, mm. so I'm, I'm, I'm also, I'm, I'm especially curious, uh, with a, a younger generation like yours, I mean, younger than me, um, <laughs> you know, that has a desire to, to play these things. Is it from the sound? Is it a tactile experience? One thing I will say in, in my experience with musicians that those who are, and I probably get some slack for this, but those who are, were not taught uh, or not um, uh, sight readers, for instance, um, may have a more tactile approach, a muscle memory, so to speak, yeah. or, a, or, you know, that physical pattern. Um, so yeah. what do you, what, what is your experience when you speak to other people? Why do they like the vintage instruments? What is the appeal? It's such a great question. Like that is like the question and it's going to be, I've thought about this a lot. It's going to be different for different people. For me, and, and I'm not trying to sound controversial or, you know, or anything like that. For me, I am so sick of the fakeness in the world at the moment. I, I, I am over it. I'm sick of the look how great my life is on Instagram or um, that sort of stuff or, you know, sucking up to a company to try and, you know, get a deal out of them or I just want something real. I think we're all hungry for real things because you see through the, the fake that exists a lot now in social media. So how does that translate to, to instruments? I, I personally, and I can only speak to how I feel, I personally want to play something that is real. 
um, because it doesn't resonate to me if it's not. So for example, I've got the Korg Kronos 2, which is a fantastic all-in-one and it's required because it's got Mellotrons, it's got Hammonds, it's got Rhodes, it's got Wurlitzers, it's got Clavinets. I can't afford all of that stuff individually and I wouldn't want to gig with it because it'd weigh a ton. So I play that, but I, I'll be honest, when I play it, I'm not as anywhere near as satisfied or happy as when I play a real Fender Rhodes or a real Wurlitzer or a real ARP 2600 or a real Odyssey or a real Mini Moog because it's a sample. You know, it, it's sampling something that was real and every time you play that sample, it's going to sound the same every time. Whereas with analog gear, these little idiosyncrasies that happen that make it sound different and you have to treat it differently. You have to tune them. You have to take care of them. And they become almost like uh, a living, because they are a living, breathing instrument. So, and again, I'm not trying to sound too strong in this, but I'm really passionate about real instruments because Again, you get tired of the fake. I, 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 I've compared like the top rompler when people go, oh, yeah, you know, you can't really tell the, tip, the difference. You play like one saw wave from a 2600 and you play a 2600 clone as good as they are, I can hear the difference. And where people who um, are very vocal about, oh, yeah, but the audience won't be able to tell the difference, this is going to sound horribly selfish and I love our audience, but I don't care. It's not about what they hear. It's about what I feel is real because that's going to get the best out of what I play. And then, and then the if I play out. better, then they're going to enjoy it more too. So that whole argument of like, oh, yeah, but in the live mix, you can't tell the difference, that takes away from the whole, as you said before, the tactile nature and the connection you have with it. You know, I've got a connection to this because I have to manipulate it to make it work. I've got a connection to it because I've had to have it serviced. I've got a connection to it because I've learned it so that if something breaks, I know where to fix it. And it is it is what it is. It's not trying to be a thousand things in one. It, it's it's a monosynth. It's, it's brilliant and it's rich and it's raw and it can be unstable. You have to tame it. That to me is far better than any sort of mass produced jack of all trades, master of none thing. And there you know? is, you know, there is and the, that's, the, that's philosophy, not... the philosophy of the happy accident is also, I think, really works well with yeah. analog because um, discoveries are often made by accident. You know, this wasn't what I intended, but this, yeah. this might work better or, or something. So Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I've, I've bought, to, to give you a classic example, I've bought back in the day a Moog Voyager, and that's a real instrument. You know, that's a beautiful, beautiful instrument. But I sold it because I found I was just going through the patches and modifying and saving. So I sold that, and then I've actually bought <laughs> a sub-37, sold that, and bought a subsequent 37 and sold that. Because I wanted to, to have, you know, it on stage. And, and at the time I thought maybe it's safer to have a synth where I make the sound and then I save the preset. And what I was doing in live performance then was pressing buttons when I wanted to change the sounds, which is, you know, it, it's incredibly convenient and efficient. But I wasn't satisfied. I was like, even though I made the sounds, it's not the same as the risk you take being on stage with like a 2600 or a mini Moog or, you know, a Moog grandmother or whatever, an Odyssey, because you do have those happy accidents and you might, you know, the sound's never going to sound exactly the same, but that's the beauty, you know, that is the absolute beauty of these instruments. Yeah. Um, and I, I can't find the joy in things that say they are all of these instruments, but they're really just a copy. I, I want something real. And that's why I honestly feel like vinyl's coming back and and people are wanting to touch 
things again. They want that tactile enjoyment. They they want something real. We're all digitally drunk and we need to wake <laughs> up. <laughs> I think more than ever with the pandemic, right? So we just Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I've never felt more fuzzy in my brain uh ever um it's 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 not good for you. it's not good for you so yeah you know i'd much rather play real instruments it's completely my happy place and yeah they're not perfect but that's that's what's perfect about them so before we go um do you have a patch back there is that uh, and is that yeah uh, so le led patch cords yeah so oh these are absolutely amazing i've got it over there so we've, we've got um this company in melbourne called uh, synth cable supply company and they are great because they make these amazingly beautiful um bipolar patch cables so on a darkened stage like i want to obviously take this for some melbourne shows with acolyte on a darkened stage they actually light up the face of the the 2600 and it's they turn they're green if it's like a positive voltage and red if it's a negative voltage um which just creates a, a fantastic look and I, I i've been on their back to to make some purple ones i'm like can you make purple ones it looks so cool with the 2600 da, da, da. and they said they need to make like a batch of a thousand and i'm like oh that's a lot of patch points <laughs> But, um, well, I'm sure that we, no, I'm I, sure there's a few people uh, in the audience, and myself included, that we, we could all chip in and buy a thousand or something. Oh, like mate, it'd be magic because it's they're just I didn't know that you could do that. I didn't know that um, these things existed, and I saw. I'm so envious of um, you all in America for you know Sweetwater and all these other amazing places because we don't have really anything like that here, and. Um, I've looked at some American websites where I could buy some cables that are like this, but the shipping cost to come to Australia is more than the cables themselves. <laughs> so, but yeah, I'm, I'm very simple with the 2600. Like I, I do like to create some crazy patches, but most of the time it really is blending um, the different waveforms together because I just find, again, it's just... just so beautiful it's just even on two slightly detuned saw waves you add in some natural spring reverb and you're absolutely in heaven and obviously getting um some wave modulation brightens it up i just adore <laughs> it's so simple but it just it resonates with me like as soon as i play that melodies just come into my head and it's so easy to create music with and i think that's what musicians why people often go oh you know why do you love this so much why do you love that so much i think with musicians if you open up your heart and your mind to experiencing the instruments that and not to sound too philosophical but they do talk to you um i, I remember watching uh it was a doc a moog documentary and bob moog was saying like you know the instruments we are basically the instruments there and and it is the voice that comes through us and that's what this truly does for me it just i, I play it there's an instant connection and and song ideas come in, which I, I, I really enjoy. And I've been playing around with different patches, trying to recreate a lot of what Joe Zawinul used to do with weather reports and um, different lead patches he had there, which were just absolutely stunning. It's, yeah, it's a it's a dream machine. It was, I remember I'd, I'd never bought anything synth-wise that was this expensive. Um, but the funny thing was when I bought it, I never regretted it for a second. I was like, no, this, this needed to happen. And once, once I did, yeah, it's, it's been my electronic voice for a long time. So love it. Absolutely adore it. And then I, I run it through and I don't know how many people 
are interested in, in this sort of stuff. But um, one thing I'm really passionate about is I'll just chuck it up here. Oh. I've got my little uh, synth pedal board here, which well, I'm going to align it. Here we go. Um, which is basically a mixture of a lot of different analog pedals and a digital one with the, it's very difficult to, to get um, tape echo unless you buy a, a tape echo, actual tape machine. Um, but I've experimented a, a lot with running synths through guitar pedals and always happy to field any questions for people because I've really done it through research but mostly trial and error because some pedals say that, oh, we can take, you know, line inputs and they can't. Um, so <laughs> I've learnt a lot about uh, signal flow, a lot about impedance, a lot about what effects actually work and, and what effects don't, what effects say they will work and, and, and actually don't. And it, it's another world, Dina, like it's, it's, it's amazing because you learn about like companies like Strymon that have like an analog front end and back end. So where the sound comes in and comes out, it's so important because it remains in the analog domain and the effect is sort of added to it. Whereas some other pedals um, I learned later basically take your beautiful analog, analog signal and then turn it into digital and, and sort of kick it out. And I've AB'd them um, and the difference is actually quite large. Again, I'm sure, you know, someone will say, oh, no, it's probably not. But again, <laughs> everyone's ears are different. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I try to use a lot of uh, analog stuff because I just love the sound of analog, not trying to be like an analog snob or an analog purist. I just enjoy the sound. But then I run it through uh, Al Capistan by Strymon at the end because it's stereo. So then you can get a lot of the... Um, the wind sounds I've got through the Acolyte album to get that stereo effect is is with the Strymon tape echo, which is which is brilliant. But um, yeah, phases are amazing. The Moog phase is brilliant. The flanger, analog flanger, and obviously analog delay, gorgeous. I'd love to get a, a proper analog tape echo one day. That's on my that's on my the list. Cool. <laughs> But yeah, it's great. It's a, it's a absolutely another world, and I really have to to thank and <clears throat> really acknowledge the contribution that the wonderful Lisa Belladonna has made to that world. Oh, yeah. Because um, I, I've reached out to her a few times, and she is so wonderful with her time and with her knowledge. It's it's brilliant, and that really opens up the effects pedals to me. And yeah, I, I'm passionate about it because you can really change the tone and the character of a synth with them. That you've you've really got to do the research and and know you know what's going to work. It'll save you thousands. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the tip. This is fantastic. And please uh, send us the link for that um, the, the LED cables. We are we're yeah. we, we've gone over. Um, I I guess it started again as far as the. I, when we when we had to reset so uh we've got a bit over so um i'm gonna end um now but i just want to thank you so much for your time and for your patience you want to talk well, real sure. we got it it was yeah. real today <laughs> not pre <-reported>. yeah, was... <laughs> but I, again Definitely i thank you so much guy. i really thank you and everyone thank you for joining us um please uh support your musicians and your not-for-profits check out the whole album on uh bandcamp i will post the links not just to bandcamp but to his website as well later and we really look forward to seeing what you do with your uh new project so thank you thank you so much and, and if anyone has any questions later down the line about any of the analog gear or any effects like please feel free to reach out to me on facebook um you know, I'm so passionate about all this stuff, as you know, Dina, and um, I can't uh, say how much I love it. it. It really is a passion. So please feel free to ask any questions. And also, please support the Ellen R. Perlman Foundation because what they do is, and, and um, you've done so many plugs for me, Dana, I've got to do a plug here because I, I'm so passionate. No, I'm so passionate about it. I really am. Um, what they do to bring the instruments, the ARP instruments back to life is phenomenal. And as someone that, 
you know, I was born in 1980 and, and I missed that whole phase. If it wasn't for you and the work that you do, many people would not be able to play your dad's phenomenal instruments. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. Um, it's absolutely outstanding and I will continue to be uh, whatever support you need. If you ever need any things written, um, let me know. And, of course, I'll be buying another ARP T-shirt from you after my last <laughs> one. But destroyed in the tree fall. So um, definitely reach out and support the foundation team because um, absolutely outstanding. Outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. And Chris Cameron uh, just wanted to give you a shout out here too. So, all right. Thank He's you. He's an amazing drummer I was telling you about. Who, yeah, uh, I, I thought he looked, I thought, I thought his icon looked a little familiar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone, thank you again for your patience. Um, again, the stickers at the bottom of the chat, the little money thing, uh, those are ways to donate. We will, and oh, David, we will be having a special project later in the year that has to do with Joe Zavinal. So um, please, if you're interested in uh, the groundbreaking work that Joe Zavinal did with 2600 Quadras and other keyboards, uh, in Weather Report, uh, we will be having um, a special event. Uh, can't tell you yet, but uh, it, it should be fantastic. Um, thank you again, everyone. And uh, we're just going to close and like that. Have a great morning for all of you uh, down under and the rest of the day. And have a great evening for all of you on the other side of the